We've been talking over Christmas about how God has blessed us and how God has taken care of us and all the good things we have. But as you heard the Scripture this morning, you heard words to people that weren't always that encouraging. And we're going to go through in the covenant service the things that God wants to do in our lives. But I've got to tell you, you're in a seat you don't understand. Because as Larry said, we can pay our bills. We have a place to worship. You had a bed to sleep in. We have homes to go to. We have people who love us. And for those of you, as one of my friends said, whose job is education right now, to be in school, you have a place to go to school. And your family might pay for you to go to a place where you pay to go to school, but everybody gets a public education. And, you know, we might not be the best, but there's a pretty good education system in Gaston County. And there's good, godly men and women who love students and take care of them. And we're thankful for that. You have a job, you get to go to it. Some of you have to get a ride sometimes, some of you have a car. You have people you call friends who aren't on the streets. If something were to happen to you, I bet everybody in this church has somebody they could call and say, my life just fell apart, can you help? Besides the people in this church. You are in the top 15% of wealthy people in the world. When you're paying your taxes later this spring, don't forget that. When you're fighting with the price of the cable TV, don't forget that. When you're paying more for your phone than some people get in a year, don't forget that. Amen? Understand that we have a lot. But the Bible talks about two groups of people who have more than they need. And as we approach God this morning, we need to remember what we have and what's extra. The quote is, some people are so poor, all they have is money. In the richest society in history, billions are starving for God. They have a lot of stuff, but they don't have the love or the peace or the purpose, or the strength that God gives us. And some of those people are at times some of us. Gates Foundation. I, you know, whatever you think of Microsoft, and I have issues with it, Bill and Melinda Gates are actively spending their lives giving away the billions of dollars they've earned to try to help our country our society, and the world in big, life-changing ways. They are turning things upside down for third world countries in terms of technology and access to food and health care and drinking water. They're doing wonderful stuff. But the Gates Foundation, one of their studies was to see what's wrong with rich people. Now most of us go, well, they have money, they could give me. But, but they did a study of the wealthiest people in the world in part because Bill thinks everybody should give away the money they have that they won't be able to spend anywhere in their lives. And so they did this study of what's wrong with the wealthiest people. And these are some of the things they came up with. These are direct quotes from those people. The respondents turned out, the, right, the article says, to be a generally dissatisfied lot whose money has contributed to deep anxiety involving love, work, and family. Indeed, they are frequently dissatisfied with them, even with their sizable fortunes. Some of us live around people who have a lot, and that doesn't get you a lot. In fact, it's like the dog who caught the car and doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> You know, we get to the point where we have what we need and we go, well, what's left? And kids grow up always getting what they want and they're dissatisfied. And people grow up having their every need met and they're unhappy because the money doesn't pay the bills. 
Here's the statistics. Divorce, suicide, abusive relations, manipulative spouses, parents, children, and others, bankruptcy, and loss of life are just as bad for the wealthiest as they are for the middle class. And some of those things are worse for wealthy people than they are for poor people. Money doesn't pay the bills. In fact, you've been at a time, I dare say in your life, where you looked at what you had and went, okay, now what? Because if your goal is to get a great job, if your goal is to have a great education, if your goal is to have a wonderful family, if your goal is to get a house or a car or new toys or be able to take trips and do all that stuff, and you do that, well, then you come back home. And there are people who have told me, because I worked at the hospital for a few years, that they got to the place they wanted to be and they didn't know what to do. They got to where they could take six cruises a year. I still haven't talked my wife into getting on a boat on the lake. But they got to the place where they could have a mountain home and a beach home. They got to the place where their kids got everything they asked for for Christmas. And it didn't solve the problem. Because the problem is not how big is my bank account. The problem is how filled is my life. And whatever you stuff in there, and let's be honest people, we've stuffed a lot of things in there. You can stuff drugs, you can stuff alcohol, you can stuff money, you can stuff job, you can stuff rewards, you can stuff food. Some of us are very good at stuffing food. But all of those things don't fill the hole because the hole is not to be filled by that. And so people find the same problems when they're wealthy, that people find when they're poor. They're just in different areas. Why? People in the Gates survey said, wealth can be a barrier to connecting with other people. I just want you to know I have no barriers. <laughs> they said that money runs the danger of giving the children in these families a perverted view of the world. Whose kids are better off than they were? Yeah. And did it help? No. It, it makes it worse. I have a constant um, discussion with my wife because my children are wonderful. They really do behave better than most kids and I've been working with kids for a quarter century. But you know, sometimes you have to work for stuff for it to be valuable. Right? And the more you do that, the more it helps you. And then you get a gift once in a while, but oh my goodness. Anyway, money can pervert not only the kids, but the adults. When you can write a check for what you want, you start to think that's your money, right? When you got all the bills paid, you start to think that you've done that and you've achieved that. And that's not necessarily the case. Isaiah 55, the passage that Bill read, talks to us about our life needing God. And to be honest, it starts with what was going on in the nation of Israel at that time. Isaiah came to people who were wealthy. He came to people who had stuff. And he said in... in a, a dialogue with them, he said, it's not what you have, it's what you need. And he says, you know, you don't have to have money to get what I'm offering. Jesus said the same thing to the woman at the well in Samaria. He said, I could give you living water that you would ask me for and you would never need it again. You see, there is supposed to be something in our lives that fills us up. And it's not our spouse, and it's not our kids, and it's not our education, and it's not our job. Come and get the food that God offers. Come and get the drink that God provides. God has something that will get rid of the emptiness. Can I get an amen? amen. God has something that will help you find fulfillment 
and joy instead of frustration and anger. And so Isaiah is saying to Israel, come and find that that doesn't cost you. Verse 2, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what is, does not satisfy? Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. And we keep looking at our toys. And we keep trying to get our relationship to provide us a God. I mean, let's be honest. You've asked your girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse for a whole lot more than they can offer. You've, you've given them first place in your life. You've asked them to be the one who makes you happy. You've asked them to make you feel better when you feel bad. That's not their job. <laughs> if you have a good, godly marriage, you have a person whose job is to love you like Jesus loves them. That's it. They might make you unhappy. That doesn't make them a sinner. <laughs> they might not meet your needs because that's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to love you. And you're supposed to love them both after you love God first. And I have in 25 years of ministry seen hundreds of couples where you were trying to get from somebody else what you should be asking God for. God is the one who offers you that food that fills you. God is the one who offers you the water that never runs dry. God is the one who provides the joy and the love, but you have to put God first. You can't put the person first. You can't put your kids first. You can't put your parents first. You have to put God first. And when you do that, all of a sudden the pressure's off your spouse. All of a sudden your kids don't have to be perfect. Your parents don't have to agree with you. Your friends don't have to be the ones who are always holding you up because you're always breaking down. If you give yourself first to God, God takes care of that and your other relationships can be healthy. Because we know what unhealthy relationships are, right? The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. That's from Amos chapter 8. Amos was a prophet who went to tell the people of God that God was done. i got to be honest. There's a point at which God lets you get what you want. And if you spend your life if you spend your relationships, if you spend your time and energy seeking things that aren't God, eventually God says, okay, you can have what you want. And you get into that relationship and you get those awards and you have that money and you have that big house and you have all those trips and things that you get. And you got what you asked for. And God offered you life that would never end. And God offered you a life that was full and joy that was real and peace that was permanent. And you're angry and upset and frustrated and jealous and envious and mad because you didn't put the first thing first. Right? And some of us have been down that road and we know how much it hurts. God knows your fears. God knows what you face. God knows the thing that wakes you up in the middle of the night. That's not God. The realization that you might lose that relationship or your kids might go crazy or your bank account might empty out or your job might end. God knows all of the things that hurt you. God knows all of the things that have hurt you in the past. The places that you try to stuff with stuff. The places that you try to deal with in other ways. God knows where your pain is and God is able to work in that. God knows your ignorance. Let's be honest, we all have places where we're ignorant. Where we think we're big enough or strong enough. Where we think our way is the best way. Where we think that our life is going to get us the things that God is the only one who can provide. God knows when we're ignorant about what kind of person we live with or work with or work among. Where we have an honest intent and maybe they don't. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people who are out to get you. It might be because of jealousy. 
It might be because they want what you have. It might just be because they're mean. Hurt people hurt people, you know? And God knows what you need to do to avoid those relationships. God knows what you need to do to find that joy and that peace. And God knows your selfishness. I tell my kids, anytime you say, I want or I don't want, you need to think twice. Because that's not a good reason to do much of anything. You need to think about the, the long-term reasons. You need to think about what you really want. If what I want is two dozen donuts, but long-term I'm going to weigh 300 pounds, that's not what I want, right? But if I live for the immediate, I lose the eternal. And God knows our sin. God knows the places where you've just said no to the Lord. It might be something nobody else knows. You might open your Bible every day. You might say wonderful prayers. You might seem to be great on the outside. But God knows your heart. And God knows the places where you're standing up against God and going, No, I don't want to. No, I won't. God knows those things. And God offers you a way around them. He offers submission. That's not a good word. We don't like that word. That word means I give up my control to somebody else. But how great do we do with our own lives, right? I mean, is there anybody in here who says, I've run my own life and it's perfect? Just, just go ahead. No, no, hands up, really. Yeah, all of you. Look around. We don't do it right when we do it on our own. God offers you giving your life to the one who can handle it best. God offers you a mission. We talked about the people who are very, very wealthy and don't know what they're doing or what they're about. God offers you a purpose in loving others and loving God and helping others find God. A purpose in using, as Violi said earlier, your gifts and your skills to do things to change the world. God offers you a goal and a plan that's not rooted in getting a certain bank account, that's not rooted in how many houses you have, that's not rooted in everything happening your way, but that's built on the solid foundation of Jesus that you won't fail at. You might, you might not do everything you think you could, but if you do it for God, God takes care of that. God offers you others and, and friendship and relationships that help you. God offers you a structure. How do you know what to do? Well, there's this book here. Amen? And, and, and it tells you about your attitudes. And it tells you about your habits. And it even tells you to be wise and not stupid. I read the book of Proverbs if you have a question. It tells you how to live with others and how to live with God. But you know, if you never read it, you don't know what it says. And God offers you accountability. I can't tell you the number of people I know who have stopped praying. Well, I was praying, but then God told me to do stuff, so I stopped. It happens. God tells you something and then asks you to respond to that. And that's what we're going to get a chance to do today. So in the end, God calls you to give up everything you are. But then, like Dave Ramsey says, if you don't live like everybody now, you can live like everybody later. Because when you give everything to God, God's going to give more back to you. Oh, but Pastor Joe, I, I, I love my video games. Yeah, but that's not enough to live your life. Oh, but Pastor Joe, it's sports. By the way, there's a ball game tomorrow night, just saying. Who knows? Yeah, poor thing. And... and It'd be terrible if a pastoral relation, never mind. <laughs> and the thing is, that's not enough. I mean, we got some good football players here. That's not enough. We got some excellent softball players here. That's not enough. We've got some great teachers. We've got some good business people. That's not enough. But you know, God offers you enough. And if you give your brokenness and your hurt and your pain to God, God can give you back a life that has joy and peace and love. Even when people don't treat you right. 
Even when people don't do what they're supposed to, because you're not depending on people anymore, you depend on God. And that helps you because, ladies and gentlemen, the people are going to fail you. Even Teresa's husband is going to mess up. Thank you for not saying amen. <laughs> so those things happen, and we know they're going to happen, but God offers you something that's better than that. Okay? Today we're going to respond to God's call. We're going to give all we are, our brokenness, our hurt, and our need, and we're going to receive what Christ is, holy and righteous and loving. And that's what we're going to be doing the rest of the